let's get started with chapter three uh, called Efficient Programming of the book Efficient Programming in R. Um, and I think last, like um, Sean mentioned earlier in the previous discussions, um, this chap, I mean, each chapter in this book, like he used to do uh, learning objectives. This basically just highlights, you know, top five things uh, for each chapter and then, uh, you know, covers it in detail. So um, I'll start with that and then we'll dig into the details. So um, for uh, working efficiently in R, uh, we, we, I mean, the author suggests that there are five top tips that you should keep in mind. Um, never to grow your vectors and which basically means that, um, you know, start with, I mean, as long, as much as you know, uh, start with, you know, uh, defining a vector of that size and then work with it. Um, and, and I guess we can talk about the details as we go forward, but the next tip is to vectorize uh, your code as, as much as possible, whenever possible. Um, and I think this probably could resonate a lot more with people coming from different programming backgrounds to R. I think that in my head is uh, the biggest advantage of working in R coming from SAS. Um, I could see how helpful that was. Um, then they, uh, the authors also suggest using factors. Um, and as you see, they say using factors when appropriate. So in the details of the section, it mentions that there's no hard and fast rule when you should do it, or, or, or there are suggestive ways, times when you should use it. But there's no thumb rule that, you know, this is when you should use a factor or when you should not use a factor. So it's very situation dependent on, um, whether you should or you should not use, but in general, uh, they're slightly more efficient than strings. So based on your use cases, uh, use them when uh, when it makes sense. Um, then um, they suggest to avoid unnecessary computations by caching variables. Um, now caching as a concept is uh, talking about, you know, doing some calculation at one time and then reusing it. Um, and it makes sense when you know, your inputs to a function or to a data frame is not changing um, during every run. And uh, if that's the case, then definitely you should, um, you know, do the calculation part once. And ob obviously, you know, like theoretically, technically speaking, you should not do it uh, ever again, as long as it's, uh, as long as its inputs are not changing, um, you know, run it once, save it in an object and then use the object instead. And then, Fifth, and I was happy to see your note, John, was probably the least interesting part for me in, in this chapter was the byte compilation um, piece. Uh, so what the tip is that, you know, you byte compile your packages for the performance boost. What I think this means is, um, so a lot of packages in, um, in R, so it says that installed R packages, when you use that, by default, all your packages are not um, compiled, um, which may mean, you know, different kinds of inefficiencies, but if you, you can force it uh, to use it from source, which is the compiled version of it, and then that makes it uh, more efficient. That means uh, uh, basically a compiled code or a byte compiled code is when a code runs in byte code or the lower level language, uh, it runs faster. Um, so now we can start to dig in deeper unless there's any any specific question or concern I should address first. Uh, just uh, uh, byte compiling is separate from installing from source, just FYI. And we can talk about it more when we get there, but mostly we don't need to talk about it because it's just automatic now um, okay. as of 3.4 and than more so in 3.5. Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, all right. So what, what does it mean when he says don't grow by vectors? Uh, don't, don't grow your vectors. Um, so this, uh, this portion of the chapter starts with this comparison exercise where, uh, you know, it, it, it give, they give an example of saying, you know, you create a vector, which is, you know, 10 numbers from one to 10 and how, would you go about adding you know, a constant to it? So if I were to add one 
to this x to all the elements of this x you could do, use different approaches so one is using a vector um so i'm saying x is equal to x is plus one and then that since x is a vector just do, just saying this once is going to implement that to all the elements of that vector so uh in under the hood what this really means is just one call to the function uh, which is a plus operator in this case um you could also do this and probably in other languages we would use a uh, for loop to you know do this iteratively saying when i uh, when it's i do i plus one and so on and so forth so this will actually be calling the plus operator 10 times in this particular case because we have 10 elements so or, or n times when we have n elements um so when you benchmark this using microbench or bench uh, package um uh, you can see that on an average it's at least about 2x the amount of time that it takes although in this case it is nanoseconds but obviously you know as the operation becomes uh, operation or your function becomes complex the exponentially this time would grow um and the second part in this um or sort of parallelly you know when we talk of execution it also sort of relates uh back to back in to memory so in when when we're talking about memory allocation for a vector uh you could think of it as assigning it you know assigning telling it, going into the ram and saying this is how uh this is what this is what points to this new vector or new object and at this point it has no play you know it has no element so it starts with just one pointer and then you keep growing it which also means you know function calls now if we, we look at these examples that are shared um so if you and and i felt so guilty about this process because i think this is what i was used to doing that you just name a vector or an empty vector you call it null or you know you do a c with with no other elements in it and then you say okay now i know um uh, from from whatever other source you're getting some information and then you're adding elements to it and then you print it and all that jazz so this is uh when we are starting from zero we are creating an empty vector and then we're gradually increasing the length of the vector the other option is you start with you know in, in the uh if you know the length of the uh the final length of the vector you start you, you start and you still create an empty vector but with 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 that size n and then uh go on and do the assignments as needed um but uh coming to the vectorized version form of this function is uh so for example if you know that you want to give it an n length you assign it using this function which automatically does that for you so um same way you know when we when we benchmark this we can see the the improvement uh, i don't know how to highlight only this portion um, maybe i'll annotate it but yeah so i'm i'm saying the, on an average the amount of time that it that this takes is about a thousand right so that's the amount of gain that you can do. So I think the, in, in the book example, it it, um, it ran for n is equal to 10 to the 7. And the performance improvement was about 40 times. Um, so Jim has a question. Is R bind an example of growing a vector? Um, I'm thinking if, if anybody else has if any you thought. do it, If you do it in each for loop, yes like that is a common case of when people will um make slow code is by adding a column one at a time um versus a lot of times what the more efficient way to do it is create a list that is like all the stuff that you're going to want to add and then bind it all at the end so you can just be making this list and you know how many columns you're going to do or whatever and so you can set that up ahead of time and then add it once it's you've done whatever complicated calculation you're doing um but that was to take it beyond the uh or you know maybe went into a confusing area but the general idea would be get the spot for your 
data to go into and then run your for loop because filling in a column that exists is is faster than uh, recreating. So, uh, John, so to make it as to think of a simpler example, I always use our bind or bind rows in without loop, but you know, when I have multiple um, objects or data frames, which are at least closer in structure, and then I say, okay, fine, I'm I'm done with this calculation. Then I calculate another one, and then I say R bind. But that's just once, or maybe a couple, maximum a couple of times in the process. I don't see how that should be a bad idea. But that's anyway. that's probably fine if you're not if it's not in a, like specifically inside of a loop is when it's a problem because mm -hmm. if you're gonna like hundreds or thousands of times call our bind oh, when right. you could just be calling it once at the end oh the yeah and okay yeah I, and i think that's basically why you would we would use iteration and when you said put things stuff in the list and then maybe do a map for right. a map or, get, check out get it done. Uh, mm. so when you they, have for example a thousand files in a folder that you want to read yeah, so you, right. you use the list dot files maybe in that one to get the names of the files in a list and then use that list, apply the function read dot csv or whatever read underscore excel that makes sense in that case. And yep. that um would and you do a map DFR that would just create everything so, and push all the results into one uh data frame. Yeah, they actually recommend um this list r bind now instead of dfr map dfr i'm not sure i think that it still works the same basically um i'm not i'm not 100 certain why they separate it out like well that they're basically doing that for you if you do map dfr but what it does is it makes a list of all the data frames and then it combines them all with list r binder r binder you know, however you're going to do it. So step one, make make that list. You know how long the list is because you know how many different files you're going to read in. And so you have that like pre-declared size. And that's the thing that um, every time you like add an element to a list, R is actually making a new list that is the original list plus one extra slot. And that's why it gets so slow. If you're growing it out, you you know, you're making a new list, making a new list, making a new list, and it has to keep clearing the old one out of RAM and it just, it makes a mess. Versus if you make that one list that has the right length, it can then just like put the things into those slots um, and it doesn't create a new one. So that's, uh, so that's this is the big secret. So both list and a vector? I don't, like there are all kinds of complications on vectors and often on a vector, it isn't that big of a deal to add a thing. Although, I mean, I think to add a thing, you have to be creating a new vector that is the old vector plus one thing. Yeah, but then um, this this topic specifically talks about vectors and it doesn't yeah. highlight list at, mm -hmm. as such. And I mean, we all work with data frames. We do that growing and removing things all the time. With that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say that this is most, a thing for lists but uh you know like even th the example they showed was a a vector and it still was faster uh to do it um pre-declaring the length yeah um, um so the uh, list r bind function uh i think it's Contrary to the map DFR function from per, it cannot apply the function on its elements before. It, so yeah, it, you do like I like I say, I don't know how much it matters yet, but in the help for map DFR, they now recommend that you just use map and then use list R bind on the thing that you create with the map. Um I think mostly they're recommending that just to uh Kind of avoid confusion about it but i don't know they they flagged it as superseded they're saying no it's better to just use map and then list r bind or list mm -hmm. c bind um 
is this the latest update for i mean update from the latest um upper changes i think that the was next? part of uh i think that was per 1.0 um and then 1.01 .01 is the latest uh i don't you know i don't think it matters that much but i think they're trying to encourage you to think about it that create your thing and then bind it together um, because in other situations when you're doing some other situation or some other way of getting the stuff, um, data frames that you then want to bind together, which are binds often do you want. All right. Okay, cool. So I'm going to try that. Um, the next bit within, uh, this is the next section, I think. Yeah. So, um, so it, it basically now talks about or gives another example of how it looks like when you work with and without a vectorized vectorized code. Um, so in general, what, what they are uh, highlighting is what does it mean to vectorize a code? So basically, you want to or stepping back, what it what is it that you know in essence makes your code efficient is that the faster you can reach to the underlying C or the, you know, Fortran routines or the, the, the base level functions that R is made off of, um, the faster you can reach that the, with the fewer function calls and whatnot, the, the faster and the efficient your, your code or your function is going to be. So, so that's the golden rule. You, you want to reach the base level the fastest. And with that in mind, um, most of your most of the R functions are vectorized, and uh, meaning your inputs and outputs, you know, they all work naturally with vectors, um, and with least number of function calls required. So, the, like in the previous example, we did um, x is equal to x plus one, where x was actually a vector, but what we are adding is a constant. So that constant will be added to each and every element of that vector with just one uh, call to that, you know, plus operator in this case. Um, another example that it shows in the book is you could start with, um, you know, another example, would be, you know, you could use a for loop, do a, um, uh, define a variable saying log sum is equal to zero, and then add, keep adding the log value of each element to this new, variable and um, then when we compare this with the vectorized version of this which is sum of log x this um you know ends up being much faster much neater and more bug free more because i mean we cannot ensure it's there's no bugs but better or you know less having having lesser bugs because in this case when we're talking of log function the the first method uh, it cannot it does not handle uh, length is equal to zero scenario, but when we are talking of log zero here, um, this gets handled um, properly in in this scenario. Sum equals zero, so you know, um, that that's what it is. Um, so and the moving on, if everybody is okay, moving on to the next section. Um, so the next piece is. Uh, communicating with the users. So um, again, so the the th thought process here is then you, I mean, I, as from the user experience point of view, I think is that, you know, you uh, would consider something efficient or a robust code for a particular function when you're able to give efficient feedback of the current state to your user, right? So at least, so when somebody is using a function, you know, for example, it's a function from a package, um, the sooner they are able to um, decipher the error codes and all the messages that come out of your function, uh, the easier it is going to be for them and in a way efficient in, in, in the way of usage. Um, so for example, in you know when we're talking of a function, uh, feedback on the current state could be missing arguments, failed calculations, you know, and, and things like that. Um, and uh, the authors mentioned that in um, in the current situation, there are about three of, uh, there are three ways we can do that. So when you have a fatal error, 
you would use a function called stop and you want to use this up at the top or as, as soon as possible in your code where, um, you know, for example, whenever you have to do argument, um, what is it called? Argument checking uh, is something that you want to do. That's this, this in the top of first few lines is, you know, we want to make sure your inputs are correct. Um, they are correct in, in terms of you have all the inputs that you need that are at least you know the mandatory ones and you they are the right data type right structure class and all those things because if they're not then you uh you would handle you will catch the error uh sooner and handle be able to handle them properly you could use do that using try or a try catch and uh, there are other debugging techniques that you know we've, we've talked about this in the previous uh in another um book club in the debugging chapter um so it could refer to other uh, hadley's books and i think i can add that later um another uh, thing to think about is warnings and you can use warning function for that uh, to indicate that you know it's it's not a very it's not a grave situation it's not a make or break you can you know with the current state of inputs that you've given you can continue to work with it but you need to know that this might cause a potential problem in future. Um, so for example, mean of a, you know, for a, when you pass null as an argument or input to a mean function, it'll return NA and also raise a warning, which uh, should give you a sense that something, um, you know, with your input was probably not right because it's it's not a common scenario to look into to be passing a null input to a mean function. Uh, there is a possibility that you know something in the process of getting to this input was uh, incorrect or you know failing and whatnot, and that which which actually led to this situation. So this warning is is a good way. It's, it's a good indicator for us to understand that you know maybe something prior to this step was not right or something must be looked into. Um, so yeah, so this point again here says that um, it's it's not a you know showstopper at this point. So you know it just it gives you a warning kind of a uh, warning message and moves on from the execution point of view. But it is still important for uh, you as a user to look into it and not ignore it right away uh, because it could uh, have some deeper issues um, involved in under the hood. Uh, the next thing that they bring up is some information that you can share with your user who are using your functions. You could use message function or a cat function. And um, in general, they say, I'm not sure the, the thought behind this, but they say you can use cat function. It should only be used with the print or a show method. And um, I, I use this quarto call, call out thing because uh, I saw this example that they've shared and I'm curious to hear more about this. So, so there is this diff time function which will perform the difference in time objects that you would pass to it and you know it'll throw some result. But when you look at this function called get S3 method and then you pass print and diff time to it, it shows, um, let's see. Uh, I tried it, but I forgot. Um, can you see my R Studio? Okay. So yes. I'm, all right. I'm gonna go copy this one. So yeah, it actually just gave this function, and um. And again, I think it's because I don't know too much of S3 things. So if I actually write the diff time, this gives this also gives you the function definition, but this is different from what this one gave. So John. The, the diff time function is creating a diff time and print is just print. It's what happens when you, uh, you know, put just the, a variable into the console. Um, R calls print or whatever that variable is. So if it's a tibble, that like that's the main thing about tibbles is that they have a fancy print method. Um, if it's data frame, they print with the other data frame method. If it's a um, lubridate date time object, then it prints with the lubridate um, date time print method. Does that make any I, like- No, I didn't understand. 
so that like that's S threes are um, if it, just type type uh, print in your console without the parentheses. Yep, just and enter. So it yeah. says use method print. That is what the function print actually is. And I guess the other thing to know is that anytime you type anything into the console, that thing R is calling print for that thing, whatever you type in the console. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's how you that's how you see it is okay. it prints. And so the print function itself is just saying, hey, go find a method for print for whatever X is. So X was a function in this case when you typed print. And so it finds, okay, what is the print method? For uh, for functions, and if you go, uh, whatever that code was to uh, see um, the uh -huh. get s3 method, instead of diff time, put function into that. So just hit like up arrow a couple of times, or you can copy and paste it. This one. There you go. Yep. Change diff time to to function. Like function or yep. oh. No, um, exactly yes. that. No, 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 no. The okay. word function. Okay. And so that's saying that when uh, when um, you're printing a function, what it does is it calls call yeah calls print, but sets this use source flag, mm -hmm. and that's all. So it's the default print method. Um. That's just a quick intro to how S3 works. Uh, but th what they were trying to show, if we go back to the code above diff time, up a little, go up a little more. So this print dot diff time, uh, it's putting cat throughout the code because that's what actually generates the thing that gets printed in the console. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think the, the, conf the confusion may perhaps originate from the fact that uh, you have the diff time function, but you also have a diff time class. So there are diff yes. time objects. And when you print such an object, then it will handle the S3 method for the diff time class or so the object class diff time. Yeah. So that's it's nothing to do with the diff time function. Right. Oh, oh. But then when, so when I typed this and press enter, this did give me, so what this gives me is a function definition. Isn't that true? Yes. That's yes. the function definition for diff time. The one that you have above is the function definition for print dot diff time. It's the print function for things of class diff time. Of class diff time. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Objects, but these objects of class diff time. This is also a function. The it's the function print dot diff time. Yes. Mm -hmm. it is so actually, it's yes. It is the code for the print function when it has when it receives a diff time object. Yes. Because an an as. You have special functions as three generics, which take mm -hmm. different uh, function codes depending on the class of the object of the first argument. So, mm -hmm. and it depends on the class. So, for the diff time class, it has it takes this function code, but for another class, uh, it will use another uh, code for the print. But it is essentially the print function in case of the diff time objects. Yes. Okay, I'm thinking something and I'm gonna try but <laughs> uh, so so this is you know just running the diff time function. If I assign this to an object and then I print that object, then that's the print dot diff time function is that's when it is called. Yes. Okay. But also if you just execute that code, you're mm -hmm. creating that object. And so then that object is effectively getting sent into your console. And your console says, oh, I have to print that object. So then it uses that print method to print the oh, object. So even, without even if you just run this. Officially, even without like explicitly defining that object. Right. Uh -huh. So first that function is called. And then before it actually returns the result to the console, it would still go and 
run the print dot diff time function. Oh my god. Yes. That's exactly in fact what each function will do when it returns a result that is printing it. Mm -hmm. Unless we use the invisible. Oh yeah, that was another thing I put out for discussion because I wasn't sure I understood it. I mean, and it was something that I, was very new to me. Um, okay, I think I'm not gonna sit and try to debug this origin thing here. All right, so moving on. Oh, it's next. <laughs> yeah, you wanna continue that Flores uh, invisible returns piece? gonna hide, hide this piece um i'm i'm glad to do but um <laughs> it, it's it's relatively simple in in my mind um so as i said a function returns a result um and by default it will print it so that that's uh, because otherwise you would not see anything when you execute a function um but it is possible that you want uh, the function to, to have some side effects. For example, make a plot and not actually return or print at least a value, but it, it may still return a value, but you do not want to see it uh, printed in the console. It could be, for example, the data frame that is used for uh, making the plot or something. Um, and then you can, uh, you always do have return value uh, unless you, you well, you, what you can do in the case of a function which is only used for side effects is uh, end with um, return null. For example, you have the return function to, to explicitly return something. You can return null to, to have at least some return value, but you do not want to print it as null. So you can uh, put invisible the function invisible um, around it okay. um, but also it can be some useful results which you do not want to explicitly uh, print so for example a data frame in both cases you can um, hide it by with, by using invisible um, around the return and you, you can still capture that invisible result if you assign the function to an object. So I'm not sure if I'm uh, clear. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, no, I think you, you made some very good points, um, at least in, in that direction. So I don't know if, I'll, I'll read this again, I think now with, with such yeah. a different uh, <laughs> uh, outlook to it. Um, yeah, I think that, that makes quite a lot of sense now. So for yes. functions, when you don't have anything to return or you don't need to return, oh, there's so much in chat going on. Um, and especially, I think, so when you are when, when you have to write your output maybe, or uh, when you're plotting, all of those are side effects. So in, in such cases, when we don't want anything to be printed, uh, that's when you were saying we do this, it, it makes sense. Um, and that makes me think, is it necessary for each? And I, I've never thought about this, but I'm asking. So like, is it necessary for every function to return something? It automatically will because it returns whatever executed last. So, and when, so... We, when, I, when we do a plot, right, like, like this, so so plot function maybe directly does the plotting but when it's a, a gg plot to object um i think what i've noticed is if like as an analogy if i were working on a data frame and i'm doing something you know piping and just finishing off and if i don't do a return but i just do the chunk and whatever is the final output would be returned by default but that does not happen with the gg plot to out output or object you know, I do ggplot2, blah, 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 plus this, plus that, and then I end. So I have to assign it to an object. Then I say print, you know, ggplot2 object. That's when it would actually show off on the screen. Although even, even though now I did not do any return. So. Yeah, I think 
I'm not used to, to writing functions without uh, thinking about the return value. I think, I think it's a good idea to, to always return something, but sometimes you don't want to print it. Um, I think it will depend <laughs> on the behavior of, of the plotting function, if something would, would be printed or not in, uh, in, in the other case. But I should actually try it myself to really have a good answer here. So if you look at the, the code for the print method for a ggplot2 object, okay. the print method actually runs this gr devices code that actually generates the plot. And then at the end, it invisibly returns the object that it's printing. And so it's still even there is like a lot of the, um, well, I don't know about a lot, but certain things in the tidyverse do this do something and then return what you what went in invisibly um for, if you look at the code for um glimpse uh let's see like this that's the actual underlying code to print a tibble in glimpse or to 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 glimpse a tibble and it does all these cat thing well cli cat line and then at the end, it just returns what went into it because so you can put a glimpse like in the middle of a pipeline and it'll show you what the thing looks like, but it'll pass through whatever went into it. And so it's not actually printing. It's doing this cat, these cat steps. And then after it does all those cat steps, it ret invisibly returns whatever went into it so that you can keep it going through a pipeline. But if you think about it, when you call glimpse, you don't want to see the glimpse and see the print of the, the tibble, that would be a mess. Right. And so that's why it returns it invisibly. But um, so are you storing that in the object? So, I mean, I can, I can think about some useful examples and I think I do that myself too. Even if it's not a function that's returning, let's say a plot object, like, you know, maybe a function which probably does work with, you know, more than one objects and you don't want to return everything, but just the final one. But when I am testing things in, in between, right, when, when I'm actually writing that function, I would add some print statements to the intermediate data frames. So I could potentially keep them invisibly for future references. So does it like, when I, when I do invisible to that object, would it stay in, in like, so when, whatever is returned from that function, does it become a list now? Like how would, how would you access that? Um, I'm not sure if I'm following right, but um, it doesn't matter uh, for the return value whether you make it invisible or not. If you assign it, you will have it in, uh, in the resulting object. So uh, invisible only affects the fact that something will not be printed. But indeed, if you look at, uh, for example, uh, QR, if you look at the print method for the ggplot uh, class, and uh, then it ends with invisible. And indeed, uh, there is in the, I saw in the qplot function documentation, an example, of a function that wraps qplot and just ends with qplot. And if you execute it, it will not print something. Mm -hmm. It is because that invisible takes effect in uh, functions that just call qplot and don't do anything after that. If they would, then they would return the last line of, of um, what's happening there. And then you may want to make that invisible. So as in the example in the book, where the model uh, is, is at the end, but uh, it is returned invisibly. Mm -hmm. the, I pasted the invisible section from advanced R uh, mm -hmm. that that might be helpful for you to look at. Okay. Sure, okay. So mm -hmm. I guess I'll come to that after this discussion. Um, mm -hmm. I'll move on. If that's okay, everybody's good sure. so far. 
I think it was just me having the most trouble. <laughs> okay, so next um, is uh, factors. And uh, so in, it, it gives a good description of, uh, you know, what factors are or how we use them. So factor is basically the newest, or uh, it's, a, it's a data type that is mostly unique to R, uh, most likely only to R, uh, or at least um, very different from what most of us are used to from other programming languages. Uh, and a factor is used to store a categorical variable. So it is similar, it looks similar to a string, but it's actually treated differently by our, uh, you know, by, uh, by our software. And it is actually, when, when we look at it, so it has, um, it has labels and levels. So it, it actually presents uh, at a visual scale, it presents the string, but it is actually in memory stored as an integer. And uh, which is actually why, you know, it leads to some initial surprising behaviors unless you uh, really understand that concept. Um, and like I was saying earlier, uh, you know, in terms of how often you should use them, they, you know, as a, uh, the authors have mentioned that it's, there's no general rule. I mean, the general rule is, two situations when you have an inherent order with your um, categorical variable like small medium large or you have fixed set of categories then you should consider using a factor um and again i think when even though uh, it says fixed set of categories you know thinking you're you're not growing that list of categories or and and ideally you know it's a smaller set like maybe 4 5 6 categorical variables in in that variable is um when you should make it a factor i don't know if like uh, cities or sorry states in us which is 50 if if it's like how does that make if, if it makes sense to consider that as a factor when you're playing with the geographic data but uh, if anyone has any thoughts please go ahead and speak now i missed uh, what your question was um so i was saying so if so based on you know how they describe factor to be right so um if um so if in general rule they say if there is an inherent order to your data to your categorical variable that's one use case when you should use factor the other is when you have a fixed set of categories um and the way i read it as a fixed set you know that was a, a limited set like a few uh, categories in your categorical variable. Uh, but if I translate this to a states column in, for US, you know, let's say some, some geographical data, let's say you're looking at census data, would you consider uh, the states column, which can have potentially 50 values, would, would that be a good candidate for a factor or not? Uh, yes. And I mean, it depends what you're doing, but one advantage is then you can't put anything into that column that isn't a state. Mm -hmm. And so if you get data that is something else, it will it'll become NA and R will give you a warning that um, it coerced it to NA. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one reason to, to work in factors. And then also just um, even if it's, 50 different things that's smaller than the possible universe of strings. And so it's still gonna be um, faster to work with. Um, I had, oh, the other thing to know is a lot of programming languages have um, enums, which are basically I factors. So um, if you see that like JavaScript works with enums sql has enums oh, i think javascript is python I has get described as enums. SQL. i never thought sql has enums well, look, sql definitely has enums okay that's where i learned about python, them python has it too. Yeah. <laughs> okay um uh, so yeah jim has a question are, aren't factors integers under the hood yes they are so the levels um uh, the it's it's the levels right that that are taken as integers. Um, the the levels are the text. It's using an example of numbers is where it gets confusing. <laughs> so watch out for that uh, because if you do, like okay. if you do, um, if you want to see something crazy, do this. 
Um, or for example, I think this, let's see, open this before I share it. Yeah, well, not even, it's even worse. So that gets NAs. Um, but yeah, the as integer thing, what it does, because the integers that it assigns are just like starting at one. So if you have numbers 27, you know, 100 through 200, but you start with one, they will basically subtract 99. Um, hmm. uh, that, yeah, I mean, so that one's, yeah, okay, I can see what it's yeah, there. just my down and your down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it uh it alphabetizes is why it's two then one. So yeah, and by I think default, by default it gives us this one and two by position, but we can always re-level this. It's uh, doing it, it sorts them alphabet alphabetically, and then the first one is a or first one is one, second one's two. Okay, so okay. So it takes so, it's doing so like, um sort unique on mm. the input to to decide what levels right so that's how austin gets one yes a, and then the mm. it gets two okay cool uh so does that answer <laughs> jim a question unclassed a factor to see integers oh my god what is that <laughs> unclass okay oh yeah that's the other way to do it uh, you don't need the as there, no, I didn't because it's a city I did not create it as a factor. Two one. But yeah. Yeah, I, I just created this as a string. That's why I was doing as dot factor all the time. But yeah, uh, Jim, unclassing it is uh, makes it <laughs> turns it into an in integer because factors are a type of integer, basically. They're they're a special class of integer. Um, which is why they're more memory efficient. Basically, you only save the character values once. So really it only may it's it only matters to make it a factor if at least one thing in your factor appears twice. Because if it doesn't appear twice, it's still saving that list of names once. Um, so it doesn't save anything. But if it if you do have something, you know, if you had um you know, Austin, Austin, Natic, then Austin only gets saved, the, the word, you know, that, that mm -hmm. string of characters only gets saved once, and that string of characters is bigger than an integer. So. Yeah. But what does it mean that it is, where is it saved? Because, I mean, it, it to me, it looks In, like, a, so it, like a lookup table. Do um, this. Oops. Yeah. Do that, and then that. Okay. <laughs> and so, inside, or, or if yeah, I guess if you just type X, whatever, in the object X. Um. And if you do, what is it, uh, levels X, like X has this, um, uh, <laughs> hold on a sec. I need to actually type the things into my console that I will do to type, so. Yeah, so if you typed, or we have our X, and then if you do this, um, or if you just do there, that's actually better than str. Um, that you can see that x object is, it's one through five, and then it also, it's, it's, so it's just the integer one through five plus this levels attribute and the class factor. Those three things together make are do special things with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yes. So much, but yeah, others. 
although i'm not sure how different class and type of ends up being in some cases they're same in some cases they are in other cases they aren't and that's learning when they aren't is when it's useful <laughs> <laughs> Because exactly. type of is only the base R things, the the mm -hmm. not even you know beyond base R like the um, uh, what is the word primitive, or the um, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, going down to the the C level breaks things, yeah. breaks my brain even more. So um. All right. Anyway, so, uh, so. so yeah, so now I think we had a good discussion on how factors can <laughs> be confusing and not understanding the right source of data and, you know, not understanding the right structure class and type of and attributes and those kind of things about the variable, which is actually factor could cause a lot of inefficiency. So, you know, if you could, if, if I end up doing a mathematical operation on a factor, which looks like an integer, will not work out and it will throw an error and you'll not you'll, you'll not be able to figure out what's going on which is what i'd exactly done um, to what john was saying so this this basically leads to extra source of inefficiencies and why that's why this piece is here for discussion moving on to iteration we could do this uh, any set of activities that you need to do repeatedly you could use for loops or apply family of functions and per map family of functions. Um, this book contains, uh, you know, detailed examples of apply family, but I thought now that we have per, we could go through that, or at least I wanted to just bring that up. I, it's likely that I think we all know it. So I didn't want to spend too much time and for the amount of time we have left. Um, the next piece is caching variables. Uh, like I said, so in simpler form, when you have something, uh, if you have an input or a function which needs inputs which don't change so often, it makes sense to do that action uh, once and reuse that and, and save it in an object uh, and, and reuse that, that uh, as much as possible. Uh, in some of in some advanced form of caching, caching it, it says you could use a memoise. I think memoise is it, that's how you would pronounce it. Mm. It's a package which you could use um, uh, when when you're calling a f same input multiple times. Uh, it, you know, it it has functions which will help you speed up things uh, in terms of how things are retrieved. Another interesting thing that came up was called function closures, um, and after reading it, what I understood is basically it is referring to an environment. So when we actually, we normally work with functions, we, we work with a global environment or dot global ENV, uh, but a function closure is the function environment that, you know, anything that is inside the function or things that you define within that function. Um, but it looks like John, you have something to say on that. Um, oh. But yeah, so anything that enclosing that environment is 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 what a function, closure means and uh, yeah john go ahead <laughs> oh, I, I i didn't really i was just scratching my head um but i i, I don't know i found this uh this example really interesting i think i mean it's basically recreating what i, I think what r6 is under the hood is <laughs> basically what he was showing there um but the idea of doing a really relatively simple set of related things where you want them to have their own um, shared uh, environment, um, where, you know, shared variables that are going between them. So that's basically what they're demonstrating with this stopwatch thing um, versus, you know, you could have three different stopwatches using that stopwatch function and mm -hmm. um, each of them have their own start and stop time. It was an interesting idea, like other than the stopwatch example, I don't have an idea off the top of my head where I would actually use it, but it was a neat example. Like I've, I've worked with function factories, which is kind of what that is, but it's like they're a special function factory and um, it's, it's interesting. So um, 
so the idea is when you call that watch equals stopwatch, you're defining an instance of the stopwatch that has its own start and stop time. And if you called that again and assigned it to something else, like watch two equals stopwatch, has a different instance and it has its own start and stop time that it holds inside of it. And so it changes the way the function works because once you like use it. Um, so each time you call the, the sub function, the watch function, or the, well, the watch dollar sign start, um, it is updating the watch function um, or the watch environment, really. I have had, I'm trying to think, like, I don't know. I can't think of a case where this makes sense other than like it, if you want to learn, you know, R6 is this idea except taken to a whole other level. Um, but it's interesting. I had never thought of doing this kind of thing. And so it's one of those where I'm like, huh, this might have an impact on my code or it might just be, well, that was a curious idea <laughs> and I'll never actually use it. I don't know yet. So, yeah, I think it's not it's not that recursive function it is just a function factory kind of thing um and yeah so i think to, just to sort of um summarize so what this says is so when you use function closure like this it is going to make a function uh if it's if it's not if it if you're using this functionality in a way, it would be more efficient, efficient or long and more complex. But when used properly, function closures can make your um, code more concise, I think. But in the beginning, it's it's a bit too, it's not a straightforward thing, let's say. So it might take some time to actually get the sense of it, how this works. Um, but yeah, I think, and um, byte compiler, I don't know if I want to talk about this. <laughs> Uh, we can it, skip it because it, it doesn't matter anymore. Okay, uh, so yeah. So yeah, we did it in time. Yeah. Um, it, you will see, like, uh, I, because of this, I played around a little bit to see, like, I was playing with the stopwatches and they don't have a byte code. And then after you use them, like, they will have the byte code when you print the function because it's just, it's compiling it when it needs to compile it. Um, so things that you define, don't get compiled until they've been used. So what, like the technically the second time you call a function is usually faster than the first time um, and imperceptibly faster. Uh -huh. um, so uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's interesting to know about it, but it's mostly just built into R now. So you don't have to think about it as of um, 3.4 and then th more so in 3.5. So. Okay. <laughs> cool. So yeah, I think that's all <laughs> I had to share okay. this chapter. Excellent. Well, I will see. Um, okay. And I did get a reply from uh Keith. He is uh he was traveling today, so he couldn't uh be on the call, but he does still plan to present next week on uh what is it called? It is efficient workflow. And I have not looked at that chapter yet. So I have no idea what's in there, but we'll find out. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing everyone there. So checking. Oh, and I did share in the chat the, the package memoize. Um, it is useful if you are writing packages and you have something where it's like really expensive to calculate something once, but if it's the same input again, the output will be the same. That's what a memoize is for. Because if it gets the same input, the first time it does the calculation, the second time it just looks it up in RAM. It says, oh, okay, here's that output that you calculated before. Uh, it can be really useful for um, various tasks. And so it's a good function or a good package to learn about if you're writing packages. Yeah, I, I used caching once. Um in one of the projects where I was using uh, R Markdown, I was generating an R Markdown report. And at the top, I would read some data from the database. And 
there were times when you know it's the same code like it's the same sql input that's going to get that fetch the data that wouldn't change and that's the first thing and that was obviously the time consuming part and rest of the code is just you know some plotting using that data so if um and i think that was parameterized report because that's how my sql query is being generated so if none of the parameters change the report just goes on so much faster because now you know, I had the cache is equal to true in that chunk mm -hmm. and then it just runs without loading the data all over again. Yeah, uh, I guess, the, you know, we're out of time, but the one thing to keep in mind whenever you're caching, uh, there's the old uh, uh, quote, by, I had to look it up, Phil Carlton, there are only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. So once you cache something, make sure that you know how to like how and when to uncache it. Because the example of if you're hitting something in a database, if the database, like if if data gets added to that database, your cached value is no longer valid. And so you need to make sure that you have something in place, which might just be yeah. the next time your session starts or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, that's the thing to think about when you're caching. And that's something that memoize does a pretty good job of helping you with, but um, okay. anything that is going to be changing outside of your package, you have to kind of make judgment calls about, okay, how long do we cache that? Or do we cache it per session or do we not cache it at all? Um, so, yep. <laughs> all right. See everybody uh, on Slack and here next week. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye everyone. Right. Bye.